St. Paul writes his epistle to the Corinthians in order to correct factions and moral disorders. Only he could effectively correct these abuses since he had converted the Corinthians. Today's epistle is the most personal of all of St. Paul's writings. In no other epistle does he give such an intimate portrayal of himself and of his labors and sufferings. He does so not to call praise upon himself. Rather, he is forced to speak of himself and his labors and sufferings in order to defend himself. He defends his work and authority as an apostle. Thus, he replies to the bitter accusations which his enemies made against him. If the Corinthians had remained loyal to him and to his preaching, he would not have needed to thus defend himself and his works. Therefore, St. Paul is justified in seeming to call praise upon himself. For even in the early Christian church, there were false teachers. These heretics opposed the work of St. Paul in Corinth. St. Paul, therefore, has the Corinthians at heart, wishing to keep them in the proper observance of the faith. St. Paul had freely preached among the Corinthians. He had received no financial support from them. Of course, he could have rightly expected material support in the ministry. And so he calls himself foolish in this respect. But the Corinthians might bear with his foolishness, since they gladly put up with fools. These fools who abused the Corinthians are the false teachers, the heretics, who undermined the works of St. Paul. And so with irony, St. Paul declares, you gladly put up with fools because you are wise yourselves. He then tells of his labors and sufferings in the ministry. Calling attention to himself might seem to be contrary to the Spirit of Christ. For our Lord had instructed the apostles, when you have done everything that was commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what it was our duty to do. St. Paul has a reason, therefore, to call attention to his works in the ministry. He does so in order to counteract the bad influence of his enemies. For his enemies boasted arrogantly with sham boasting. This is why St. Paul calls attention to himself in speaking of his origin. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I, to speak as a fool, am more. He tells of some of his labors and sufferings. In many more labors, in prisons more frequently, in lashes above measure, often exposed to death. Five times he was scourged by the Jews, each time receiving 40 lashes less one. That is 39 lashes. 40 lashes 
was considered as being able to cause death. Only someone sentenced to death would be given 40 lashes. Five times the Jews subjected St. Paul to this up to the point of death sentence. In all, he received 195 lashes. Rightly does he say that he received lashes above measure. Besides these lashes, he was three times scourged, that is, beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. He was shipwrecked three times, once being adrift on the sea for a full night and day. He had been in dangers from floods. These frequent perils were occasioned from his journeys. He describes his travels as journeying often. He constantly traveled among the cities where he had gained converts and established churches. There were dangerous routes which made him a prey to highway robbers. He laments that he had been rejected by his own nation, nor was he fully accepted among the Gentiles. In perils from my own nation, in perils from the Gentiles, since having been rejected by the Jews, he had dedicated himself to the conversion of the Gentiles. This is why he is called the Apostle of the Gentiles. Yet in spite of laboring for the Gentile nations, he is subjected to perils also from these nations. But his greatest sorrow was to be in perils from false brethren. Yes, at times he was put at danger by those who seemed to be his friends, but who betrayed him. Wherever he went, he could never escape dangers, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. He tells of his labors and hardships, in many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Yet he speaks lightly of these trials as being merely outer things. Imagine that. All of these sufferings are merely incidental. For he tells that his greatest sufferings was his constant concern for his converts in the churches he established. Herein is his day-to-day -day responsibility. There is my daily pressing anxiety, the care of all the churches. He had the heart of a father for his faithful, not only for all of the faithful as a whole, but a concern for each individually. And he had the concerns of an organizer for his churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is made to stumble, and I am not inflamed. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that concern my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forevermore, knows that I do not lie. He makes an oath, calling upon God the Father, 
to witness to the truth of what he is now about to say. He tells how and why he escaped from Damascus. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. St. Paul must have had a reason in singling out this one particular danger. Apparently, his enemies claimed that he was not in any real danger, but rather departed from Damascus out of cowardice. Yes, St. Paul had good reason to attest to his innocence and sincere and dedicated labors in the ministry. Finally, he cites the ultimate proof that he is a worthy minister of Christ. He tells of having received extraordinary graces and favors from God. These supernatural favors prove that St. Paul had a divine mission in the ministry, for God cannot bestow spiritual favors upon heretics, since God cannot approve of heresy. If I must boast, it is not indeed expedient to do so, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. In humility, St. Paul chooses his words carefully, as if he is speaking of someone other than himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, that he was caught up into paradise and heard words that man may not repeat. Of such a man I will boast, but of myself I will glory in nothing save in my infirmities. What is this third heaven of which he speaks. Well, the Jews distinguished three classes of heavens. Firstly, the heaven of the clouds. Secondly, that of the stars. But the third heaven was that of God himself. St. Paul, therefore, describes having been caught up to heaven itself, beholding the vision of God, whether he was taken up bodily or in spirit, he does not know. Again, let us remember that St. Paul was forced to seemingly boast, for he was obliged to to defend himself against his enemies. Can any of his enemies claim to have been blessed by God with heavenly visions? Clearly not, for they are heretics. And again, God cannot approve of heresy. St. Paul writes his epistle, to refute these heretic enemies. Yet he regrets needing to speak of himself and his trials and labors. If the Corinthians had remained loyal to him, he would not have been forced to defend himself. He would rather prefer to speak only of his infirmities. Although having received a heavenly vision, he had been given by God a thorn of the flesh, lest 
The greatness of the revelations should puff me up. Scripture commentators have different opinions concerning this thorn of the flesh. Some claim that it was temptations against purity. St. Paul underwent bodily penance, but I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps after preaching to others, I myself should be rejected. Other scripture commentators hold what may seem to be a more likely opinion, that is, that St. Paul refers to the persecutions to which the Jews and Gentiles subjected him. The third opinion is that he speaks of a bodily disease or deficiency that was burdensome to him and which made him a burden to others. Three times St. Paul prayed to be freed from this ongoing trial, but God assured him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for strength is made perfect in weakness. Whether temptations or sufferings, St. Paul's trials were allowed by God to counterbalance divine favors, thereby preserving him from vanity or other sins. God's grace was sufficient to enable St. Paul to stand against this ongoing trial, and God bestows grace to strengthen us in our weakness. By accepting our trials and sufferings in imitation of Christ, we place our strength in Christ. May we find encouragement from St. Paul as he declares, Gladly, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities, that the strength of Christ may dwell in me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.